good evening, everyone, and welcome to this lecture series 109. Uh, we have uh, today we'll have a presentation on Nepal's great transformation, political economy of social change and development in Nepal. I think it is a very, very interesting topic in the sense that how the society, state, politics and everything is going through uh, Nepal and hopefully we'll learn a lot today from this lecture which is based on uh, Dr. Jeevan's, Professor Jeevan's uh, research work. Uh, so with that, uh, I will let him talk about uh, the present, uh, let him present. Before that, I'll just briefly uh, introduce him. Uh, you might have read the introduction. He is a professor in South Asia and International Development, uh, Department of Social Anthropology, the University of Edinburgh, and co-director of Center for South Asian Studies at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, prior to joining the University of Edinburgh, he was a senior researcher and assistant professor at Feinstein International Center at Tufts University, the US. He has published many things among uh, books as well, and he was affiliated at the Social Science Baha uh, uh, on a research project as well. So with that, uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Jivan Sarma to uh, present his research. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Mahindra Lawati, for that uh, introduction. And thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to Social Science Baha for inviting me to give this uh, lecture, this talk, uh, which is based on my recent book, uh, which some of you may have come across, uh, called uh, The Political Economy of Social Scenes and Development in Nepal. So, as you can see on the title, I have said uh, Nepal's Great Transformation with a question mark. So, this is an invitation uh, to you all to engage uh, and ask me questions uh, on the argument that I'm going to present. Uh, the question mark is, is, is for a reason. Um, so, just to give you a very quick uh, outline of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, I'm not going to talk about the entire book. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll touch on aspects of that, uh, but I have a clear set of mission here to try and convey uh, my overall argument. And to do so, I'm going to kind of basically go through this. So I'll, I'll talk about, you know, in the title of my lecture, you see the, the phrase great transformation. So I'll try and define what do I mean by that. I'll take you through a bit of what I call Nepal's development paradox. Uh, that is the core puzzle uh, for this lecture. What do I mean by Nepal's development paradox? I'll then introduce some of the key questions that drove my research, my thinking on this, and then outline my overall arguments, my claims. I'll try to kind of quickly give you a brief sort of a flavor of evidence of what I, uh, what I use to support my overall argument. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to kind of answer questions on that because I will not have enough time in 45 minutes to try and sort of give you uh, 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 a lot of evidence in that sense, uh, kind, of, kind of granular evidence. I'm an anthropologist by training, so I've done field work in Nepal over the last 20 years. Um, so I'll be able to kind of reflect on that from that, that sort of, you know, my, my field work. And I'll end this uh, lecture with uh, my uh, conclusion on, on what I call precarity and paradox in, in one's remote uh, uh, reason. That, uh, the argument being that Nepal was very much a remote reason in the world, uh, but uh, it is going through a major sort of transformation. And what are the sort of precarities that are now being produced through this transformation? And then contextualize what I call development paradox, okay? So let's get started with the concept. So, so how do I frame Nepal's great transformation? So, to make it very clear to the audience here that I'm using great transformation, the phrase, in two different ways. The first, in a sort of very generic sort of sense, in a very literal sort of sense, that it is to talk about irreversible qualitative state change in the way politics, economy, and society are organized beyond what we call a continual or normal processes of incremental change. 
those of us uh, in the room know that you know social change takes place regardless of anything, right? But when we talk about great transformation, we're talking about a step change, something that is rapid, something that is compressed. Noting that such transformation is often fraught with tensions and paradoxes and contentions, right? The second meaning of great transformation that I draw on is in a, is in a more analytical sort of uh, uh, term, uh, which is based on uh, the work of Karl Polanyi uh, in, his, in his book called The Great Transformation. So that's where the title sort of comes from, okay? So when I talk about great transformation, I'm talking about great transformation in both of these ways, and I'll try to illustrate how. So for those of you who are not familiar with Polanyi's uh, work on great transformation, I'll give you a quick sort of taster in, in the most simplified form, uh, and here it is. So Polanyi never uses great transformation except in, in the title and in, in one place in the book. The entire book is, is about what Polanyi talks about, double movement. So let me try and sort of explain it in, in a very simple sort of way. Polanyi talks about double movement. There are two movements. Uh, the first movement is a movement of society from pre-market and pre-industrial system when economic activity was rooted in familial, kinship, religious, and political obligations to what he calls market society, right? So what does he mean by that? He, when he talks about market society, what he means is market society is a society where we have commodification of land, labor, and money, okay? So to put it simply, in a much more simpler way, when he talks about the first movement from pre-market society to market society, he's not saying that in pre-market society there is no market. What he's talking about is in the pre-market society, market was serving or servicing the society, right? Two, now in market society, society is now serving the market. Yeah? Does it make sense? So that's what uh, Polanyi means by, uh, you know, the first transformation. So instead, you know, instead of market serving all of us, now it appears in his argument, in his first movement, that society was now being servant to the market. Because of this movement, uh, uh, Polanyi argues, there is a counter movement that emerges because when society starts sort of serving the market, when market becomes has heavy hand in every aspect of our life, there is a counter movement that emerges from below. So what he calls by the second movement, that is the counter movement to the first, that is when the disruptive force of market society that led to poverty, job insecurity, ecological crisis, this was brought under control by state regulation, reform, and more importantly, uh, social protection. Okay? So why is Jeevan Sarma talking about Polanyi and his great, great transformation which was developed in Western, you know, in a very different timeline in 19th century Western Europe to talk about Nepal? I believe that it is possible to use Polanyi's framework to try and sort of read what, uh, what uh, Nepal has been going through. Uh, not in the sense that we just take that concept uh, from that particular time in that context and apply it uncritically, I think we need to kind of engage with this uh, in, a, in a very critical way because we are talking about a very different time, we are talking about a very different space, okay? And I'll do that. So the, the puzzle, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is as we know, Nepal has uh, experienced uh, what I call a compressed uh, political, economic and social transformations since 1950s. Uh, which has become much more pronounced, as, as we all know, since the 1990s. So the word compressed is very important. What took perhaps 200, 300, 400 years in, in the West took place in Nepal within you know, a few decades. Okay? And that, that aspect is really, really important. That it is, in a very short period of time, we've witnessed significant uh, political, economic, and, and social sort of changes changes and aspects of those I'll, I'll talk about. So politically, 
Nepal has moved from centralized Hindu and monarchical state to a federal, secular and republican state, right? With ideas of rights, inclusion and equality fully ingrained in Nepal's constitution, in the public debate and so on. Economically, there has been a gradual shift in the political economy of rural livelihoods. And I would not just say rural livelihoods, livelihoods in general. Okay? It is in this context, out-migration, which has a long history in Nepal, has emerged as a key project of freedom, particularly for young people, although paradoxically, uh, as we know from the news reports, from my own work and other people's work, it is often made with what I call unfreedom. Okay? So that's the sort of puzzle to try to make sense of. Uh, you know, it is very rare that you know, social scientists uh, you know, come and, and try to kind of bring uh, the, kind of the economic sort of changes, the political economic changes with uh, you know, changes in, in the nature of state, uh, talking about sort of you know, bringing you know, anthropology, sociology, political economy together. Is, is very rarely done. So what I'm trying to do here, my experiment is to try to kind of you know offer uh, an integrative sort of framework to try and understand uh, whether uh, and and what kind of relationship is there between the political changes that Nepal has witnessed and and sort of economic changes and other other drivers of of change. So these are some of the questions I'm interested in. So what does it mean to talk about change? Uh, transformation and transition in Nepal beyond Nepal's stereotypical image, particularly in the Western academia, the, the idea of fatalism, the idea of you know immobility, agrarian society, and so on. The sort of Nepal, when you know people talk about Nepal, they talk about oh well, this must you know uh, this must be a state where a large number of people sort of you know uh, uh, derive their livelihoods from agriculture. People don't really move that much, you know. There is this idea of, you know, uh, uh, Hinduism in particular, for instance, is often emphasized in terms of fatalism. Um, uh, there is no mention of, sort of, for instance, pragmatism, right? Uh, so, how are powerful historical processes uh, experienced and negotiated? So, um, that's the second set of question. And how might we assess the paradoxical effect of these transformations in people's lives and livelihoods, both? in terms of, as I outlined earlier, in terms of expanding ideas of rights and freedom while also producing vulnerabilities and, and precarity. So these are my sort of arguments, which I believe is, is pretty much clear by now. So what we've seen is this sort of widespread consciousness of historical marginalization and calling for rights and citizenship together so this is this aspect is very important. Okay, so there is a twin process of consciousness of historical marginalization and calling for you know correction of that you know by uh, demanding rights and citizenship, together with increased opportunities for labor out migration and caste. These have certainly uh, offered aspirations and ideas of freedom for the historically marginalized and laboring population, away from kind of old forms of precarity rooted in what I call a task labor that is based on caste and feudal logics, right? So in other words, what I'm talking about here is, you know, if the political economy was very much based on land and labor relations that were very much rooted in feudal and caste logics, have been challenged, at least at the discursive sort of level, and there is an opening to it, right? So at the constitutional level, at the political level, we you know, I've, I've indicated the kind of ideas of rights and citizenship and so on. At the level of livelihoods, that is also, you know, at the other, other side of it, at the level of livelihoods, people are now able to draw their livelihoods away from the land. If land is so central to this uh, whole idea of labor and, you know, kind of feudal logics, people don't necessarily need to rely fully on land, as we know. So that's, that's one sort of, you know, aspect of the argument, right? Yet, the actual experiences of labor out migration are exposing migrants and their families, and their households, to new forms of risks and precarity. Despite this, the argument is that Nepal has not seen counter movement from below uh, calling for social protection. If we were to follow 
Polani, if there is, you know, th there are these precarities that are being generated when people are desperate, there is some form of counter movement that comes and we will try to correct. We have, my argument is that we've not seen counter movement from below, particularly for social protection. So while there have been, you know, significant shifts in politics, society and economy, great transformation in Polonian sort of, you know, Polanian sort of sense is, is very unlikely where the counter movement from below for social protection, I would argue, is not yet there. Let's, let's put it, you know, let's, let's be, let, let me be a bit more modest um, uh, uh, than what I've written here. Um, so what I've done in, in my book is, is uh, you know, apart from the introduction, which basically offers what I've just talked about, um, it offers four empirical chapters. Uh, to uh, illustrate, you know, what I call great transformation. Okay, uh, it is not to say that these are the only four areas where ne you know Nepal is experiencing transformation. It is very much based on my own engagement with the material. That is, so these evidences that I present, these four chapters that I have that I have in my book, are based on my own work, uh, my own field work in Nepal. Uh, where I think I'm, I'm in a very good position to, to present evidence to support my argument, okay? Uh, and I welcome others to kind of, you know, go and find out other, uh, other aspects of transformations and, and bring those to the conversation. The first one is, is um, the argument on subjects to citizens, right? Uh, I'm not going to kind of read this uh, fully, but you know, I'll, I'll let you get a, a flavor of it. I don't know if people at the back, can you read that? Yeah, no? Yeah, okay. So I'll not read it, but you know, give you a sense of, uh, you know, what do I mean by this transformation from subject to citizen? I'll read out, briefly read out the second one. Uh, a, tala, a, a Dalit man in, in Tarai, in western central Nepal, uh, uh, said this. He said, they uh, didn't like us wearing good clothes. So if they saw you wearing good clothes, they would call you and make you carry dusty bricks. They were very bad. All those days are gone now. The old man is dead. Okay. Um, the first one is, is also kind of, you know, you talk about dignity and respect very much. How, you know, what else? You know, these are sort of interviews with Dalit uh, activists and, and uh, you know, uh, Dalit man in, in, the, in the second case who articulate uh, what has changed uh, in, in terms of, you know, caste, um, uh, in terms of dignity and respect. You know, there is a kind of consciousness uh, that we've been treated very badly and now uh, things seem different, uh, which is not to say that things have transformed, okay? So these are, the perce these are perceptions of individuals uh, that does not necessarily, in any way, uh, the claim is not that things have completely been dismantled, but there is a consciousness uh, of, of, of about it. So what I talk about in this particular chapter is uh, talk about uh, uh, this movement from uh, what I call subjects to citizens, uh, claiming for rights and uh, you know kind of historical sort of consciousness of rights. That is, who <coughs> are we? What sort of rights we have? And we have, you know uh, and be able to kind of articulate that these uh, historically we've been marginalized and you know kind of therefore demanding rights and so on. So I talk about caste and untouchability, gender discrimination, and women's position. Uh, not to say that you know women's position in the fieldwork I, I you know I did I had changed significantly, but uh, uh, women did talk about you know uh, this is not necessarily right. You know, so if my for example as a joke, you know, someone would say if my husband beats, uh, not that the woman in, in question was going to kind of necessarily. Uh, going to uh, beat him back. So he did say, well, you know, I can also beat him back. I can talk about it now. Uh, which is not to say that she, she is going to do anything. Okay, so you have to be quite, quite careful about, quali you know, qualify what, I, what I'm saying here. And there is shift in local power relations, which is very much to do with the kind of, you know, power no longer, em you know, emanates just from land and those fuel uh, sort of logics based on land and labor relations. Power uh, in contemporary Nepal emanates from uh, access to resources, access to what uh, uh, sociologist uh, uh, Joanna Park Zarnika talk, talks about, distributed coalitions, right? So there are these development funds, uh, when they travel into rural areas, there are these coalitions 
and people sort of, you know, talk about eating money, right? It's kind of distributing those resources. Um, and and, and I, in this particular chapter, I talk about the nature and drivers of, of social change. So I particularly sort of talk about how people associate all these changes to, uh, you know, various drivers. For instance, you know, people talk about ideas of literacy, ideas of education, ideas of, you know, NGOs sort of social mobilizations, but more importantly, in terms of the kind of, you know, the Maoist uh, uh, movement and the sort of rhetorics that people uh, found uh, very useful to talk about, uh, to articulate some of their grievances, okay? So the credit was, was very much given to, to, the, to, to the Maoist uh, uh, movement as well. And, you know, there are plenty of examples of, you know, how people talked about the kind of different models of, of social change, for instance, Talk, you know, I would sort of theorize it in terms of Maoist model of social change being much more reactive when things go wrong in terms of you know, people were found to have discriminated someone on the basis of caste and if the Maoist had you know, quite substantive sort of power in that particular village or in the locality they would for instance publicly humiliate uh, uh, that person right um, whereas NGOs would work with what they what in NGOs language would call you know community participants, not necessarily with the perpetrators, right? So try to mobilize community and empower in their own language the community. So the next, you know, people did distinguish between different models of, of social teams. The, the other chapter talks about, uh, which is more sort of core part of my, my work, I work in the field of labor migration and agrarian chains. Uh, and one of the significant sort of changes we've seen in, in the nature of Nepal's peasantry, uh, their mobility, and the changing face of rural Nepal. To this audience, I don't need to kind of really talk about if you've traveled outside, uh, you know, into the rural areas, you've seen how uh, uh, rural Nepal is, is no longer the rural Nepal that you perhaps knew of or that you perhaps, uh, you know, knew from other, other people. Uh, there is a significant sort of diversification of rural livelihoods. So uh, no matter what uh, the census data talks about, you know, uh, X percentage of people are farmers, or people derive their income from, you know, farming. Uh, you know, you'll see this in census data, you'll see this in World Bank statistics and so on. And I'll tell you, I've, I've worked with, uh, you know, people, those, who, you know, uh, innovators who go for census and other kinds of, you know, uh, collecting data in, in rural Nepal. People often assume that, you know, you are in a rural village, what do you do? You know, I do farming. Doesn't necessarily mean that people actually derive their source of, you know, that is the main source of their livelihoods. Everybody does farming, a bit of farming, but that does not necessarily make them farmers. Although people do, would say that, you know, how would you identify yourself? You may say, well, Krishak Lekhinus, you know, uh, Keti But that does not necessarily mean that that is, that is where people are. People are driving, uh, de deriving their income from a range of different sources, right? So labor, you know, labor, short distance commuting, labor mobility, or long distance overseas migration being one, uh, you know, of, of many. Um, but also laboring opportunities are being created in rural areas with construction work uh, and, and so on, with this money that I was talking about, development um, uh, uh, money that goes into the rural areas is also creating the kind of, you know, work uh, uh, in construction and other sectors. The second point is something I, I briefly mentioned earlier. It's about weakening of caste-based feudal relations, right? So people have a choice not to work in the land, in the sense, right? So this choice will have to be you will have to use it with, with quote. People no longer need to go and work with the landlord uh, in the village or in the nearby village. You have some degree of flexibility to go out and work in the market, or you know, even in the market, you know. There's a constant sort of, you know, uh, complaints you'll hear from uh, landlords that, oh, it's so difficult to find labor. Oh, they're asking for too much money, right? So you can see this in a very positive way that the, the bargaining power of labor has gone up in that sense, right? Because there is shortage of labor, but also people don't, you know, want to work in agriculture. There is the aspect of, you know, of what I'll come to talk about culture of migration. So it is commodification of labor, uh, which is not something that started now. It has, you know, uh, uh, been going on for quite some time. But it's it, what I, my argument is that it intensified that uh, you know 
we still have uh, practices of parma and you know sort of exchange of labor, but that is very much uh, uh, on 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 way it's out. Okay, so there is a kind of you know certain value attached to it. Uh, for those of you who do development research, you know you're used to kind of saying, oh, how much is you know there is a segregation between you know uh, this much for men. You know if men earn 600, women earn 350, for instance, right? But nonetheless, there is value attached to labor. That this is how much it, it costs for a particular kind of work. Um, and then there is a widespread uh, culture of migration, which is something I've written about. That you know, out migration is a fact in, in rural Nepal. So when I'm talking about out migration, it is not just in terms of you know going to the Gulf and Malaysia, but also uh, to uh, for, for a long time to India, for instance, and for a long time within Nepal. In, in, in different sort of you know sectors of economy, and these uh, these sort of shifts in in rural livelihoods have also brought you know of course sources of freedom as I as I explained here, but also new forms of precarity, right? So for instance, in the absence of any form of social protection, um, uh, these labor migrants, internal migrants, those who work in informal sector, those who work in brick cleans, those who work in construction sector, or those who even go to the Gulf or Malaysia or go to India, often find themselves in a very difficult sort of position. When things like you know we had COVID, we saw what happened then. You know, as soon as there are no jobs, what do you do? You come back home. There is a crisis, right? Uh, and that the large number of uh, migrants who went to India were left stranded in the border for for quite some time. Or so. What I'm what I'm what I'm trying to kind of uh, uh, argue over here is that you know the old forms of livelihoods, you know, in terms of attached labor or you know kind of even bonded labor or working for the landlord in the in in in, in the village, uh, despite being highly exploitative, had a sense of sort of you know uh, reciprocity. It was based on the idea of reciprocity, based on the idea of obligation. Not that these landlords were treating these laborers any good because they wanted to kind of keep reproducing these laborers, right? So, Baule then the, 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 the children will work again in the same household, their children would work. So, you want to kind of keep them healthy so that they can work, but you don't want them to kind of you know, gain much education or you know, them do well so that they will move somewhere else and you will have a hard time finding. So, there was a kind of you know, some form of protection precarious protection, now uh, when uh, uh, these migrant households find themselves in a difficult position, they are not able to kind of draw on those, those, those kind of resources. The next chapter talks about uh, mobility, but this, is, this one is more about internal mobility within Nepal, uh, mainly for education and jobs, right? So what I talk about in terms of mobility and educational and occupational aspirations. But I talk about men and women from different castes and ethnic backgrounds uh, pursuing uh, uh, what, what they call you know, pornazani, that is to go and study uh, in the nearby town and cities like Kathmandu or even big cities like Dharan or Bhutaval or Biratnagar uh, in pursuit of what, what they think of as future, right? Because Nepali state has, together with international agencies, uh, they have promoted this idea that education is about freedom, right? So this is the, the guru of this is Amartya Sen, who's talked about, you know, if you invest in education, particularly in girls' education, this is going to be good. It's going to lead to something, right? And this idea of education, which is very much occupied by the high caste, particularly Brahmins in Nepal, that's how they maintain their kind of you know priestly identity as well as the kind of power. Uh, based on their caste privilege, is being challenged uh, by uh, uh, aspirations for mobility to cities by uh, not just Pahons, but also by uh, Dalits, by uh, Pamans, by other others. So there is a kind of you know, sense of, look, there is a possibility that we might begin to kind of invest in, in education. Uh, but it is not as simple as that, right? For instance, what, what this chapter in this chapter I talk about is when Dalits or you know Thamans, for instance, arrive or Muggers when they arrive into the cities, the kind of struggle that they have uh, to navigate 
the city to navigate the educational and occupational sort of uh, pathways, which would have been, for instance, much more easier for, for a Bahun man, because this is what they always did. They would always have someone in the, in the town or the village to find no difficulty finding a room, you know, to find, to do, uh, to find jobs, to, you know, have all those apnomancy in the right sort of places. Whereas Dalits uh, or Tamans, for instance, and Muggers, in my case, were finding it extremely difficult to kind of make that transition. You go to the, you know, to Palpa, for instance, go to the college to study, say, you know, ISC uh, in, in this case, or to the, you know, uh, to study a uh, bachelor's degree. But what do you do up with that? You know, education in itself does not give you freedom, right? Uh, it, it does not lead to employment automatically. So you've got a situation um, in Nepal, the economy is such that, you know, what I call jobless growth in the sense there is increase in, in Nepal sort of, you know, GDP uh, per capita income, but ours is a country where there, there are not many jobs. And those jobs, particularly in, 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 in the kind of, you know, more permanent jobs in the civil service, in, in the government, NGOs, private sector, has largely been occupied by the upper castes, right? So what I talk about is how do Dalit smugglers, for instance, try to kind of, you know, in, in, in the kind of given the constraints, navigate the city or navigate the educational and occupational. And this is where, uh, you know, their caste and ethnic identities become much more pronounced and much more important. Uh, that you begin to kind of, you know, bring, bring, you know, new kinds of solidarities between Dalits from the West and Dalits from the East come together under the kind of banner of Dalit organizations, you know, bring these new forms of solidarities, not just for the Dalits or Muggers, you know, with Muggers song, but also for Bahuns. For the first time, these, you know, Bahun men in particular were finding themselves conscious of their caste identity and their privilege. That, you know, it was given for them that their privilege, they didn't have, really have to think about their privilege, but they have suddenly f uh, found themselves in the cities, in, in New Nepal, in Naya Nepal, uh, uh, that being a Bahun uh, means something. You know, there is a sort of say, consciousness of someone who told me in Fritipur that, you know, oh, there is a quota system, for instance. How are we going to kind of you know, secure our so-called historical privilege in the context of, of New Nepal or Naya Nepal? So there are these emerging caste and ethnic identities in, in not just in big cities like Kathmandu, not just in big campuses like Pitipur, but also in smaller campuses and you know uh, 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 in small towns. Uh, so these caste solidarities, ethnic solidarities, are emerging in the, those spaces as well. So, two, two minutes. Yeah, I, I should be fine. So, the next chapter. Uh, talks about development and, and patronage politics. Uh, I'll try to finish before that. Uh, uh, so one um, aspect that I want to kind of highlight over here is in terms of because, you know, development or because in Nepal, right? So as a form of distribution, particularly since the Panchayat era. So Historically, what we've seen is development has largely meant in terms of kind of, you know, uh, extortion and, you know, kind of uh, uh, extortion of resources, extortion of rent through various sort of, Mahesandra Regmi has written about, you know, taxation policy, about labor policy and land policies, and how that enabled the state elite to basically extract those, those resources uh, by, the, by the elite. But it's, I think what, what, what is really important for us to kind of, I think, to, to conceptualize at least, to think about it, it because, when because became the kind of, you know, big mantra of the Panchayat government, it was used largely as a matter of distribution. That it was about distribution of certain ideas, diffusion of certain ideas of what because is, but also distribution in material sort of sense, in terms of East-West Highway, for instance, in terms of drinking water, in terms of schools, right? So what Panchai did was to kind of, you know, think about Vikas in terms of creating these new citizens, uh, but also in terms of, you know, uh, uh, distribution of various infrastructures, but also alongside that came the kind of political economy of distributed coalitions, right? As the budget goes to the Panchai, you know, the budget does not just get spent, you know, there are people who benefit from that, right? Who gets contracts, who gets to keep, you know, a, a certain amount of money, uh, and, and, and so on. So that's how the kind of the patronage system, the Zachary system, 
uh, tribes, which started with Ramas, tribe during the Pansai mm -hmm. sort of period, and it has continued. I'm not just saying that it, it stopped with Pansai. It is very much a, a fabric that we see uh, continuing uh, today with large amount of development budgets going into the uh, to the villages to you know to Singapore to the villages everywhere. Is 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 there is a kind of political economy uh, associated uh, with it. And it is very much shaped, as I mentioned earlier, by unequal distribution of land, caste and patronage system. So people who are benefiting from it are largely those who have had this sort of privileged, uh, 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 privileged position in, in, in state and bureaucracy uh, and, and, and politics in that sense. <clears throat> Last point I want to kind of talk about is, is you know, power in, 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 in uh, particularly in the, in the last seven decades, what you've seen is power does not just emanate from land and caste-based configurations, but also through access to education, increasingly through access to, uh, particularly since 1960s and 70s, through access to education, uh, new social and political networks, and new sources of rent, right? So land was a major source of rent earlier, which as, as I indicated earlier, sources of rent are very diverse now. You know, money comes uh, as as development budget uh, in terms of real estate business, land being commodified, right? So land not just in terms of uh, utter sympathy you will keep, but as a it has a certain value. You know, this is how much it costs. Uh, you know, land prices may have gone down in 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 Gao, but in the Basi, land prices may have gone up because there is a road now, right? So, so. And, and these these are not just natural sort of processes. These processes are highly political, right? Where and how land prices go up, and who benefits from what. Uh, so what I do, therefore, in, in in this chapter is to sort of talk about development uh, history and politics uh, in terms of the kind of political regime. So 1950s to 60s, the kind of initial rush for development. Um, that, and the kind of you know, this, this sort of passion, thinking that you know, just like uh, what happened in the neighborhood in India with, you know, with new, uh, new, new, newly found freedom and independence, there was sort of surge in aspiration for development. 1960, you know, three decades of Pansai system was very much, as I mentioned earlier as well, nation building through this thing called Vikas. Uh, 1990 to 1906 was a, a period of democratization. Very much, you know, with uh, with uh, opening up of space for private sector NGOs, uh, formation of professional organisations and civil society groups and media and, and banking. A lot has been written about it. But I'm, I'm just going very quickly here. 1996 to 2005, I characterise it as conflict and, and development, and there is a sort of, you know, in detail I talk about how initially conflict was seen as as an obstruction to development that, you know, well, this conflict, so maybe we can do development somehow by keeping the conflict, you know, somehow on the side uh, or by negotiating somehow with, with the conflicting parties, then development has to continue. Of course, there is a slow realization that our development model in itself has contributed to conflict, right? And there is a kind of process, I kind of chart out this history of how uh, within the development community, uh, together with Nepali state, there comes a kind of you know, certain kind of realization that you know some of the grievances that the Maoist and other uh, other groups like you know Tanzati groups or Maoist or later on Madhis uh, you know uh, uh, activists were raising uh, were very much uh, uh, you know were, were very important part of, of the narrative in that sense. 2006, 15, um, so the kind of thinking about the protracted uh, uh, political transition following the peace process, uh, comprehensive peace agreement, and the process of state restructuring, which gets settled, eventually settled again in court uh, with, uh, you know, in 2015, as we know, there was a big earthquake um, um, and, you know, pouring of international aid. And the kind of you know suddenly uh, a uh, suddenly a constitutional settlement is found, right? Uh, very quickly, until like for last nine years, the political parties had been fighting to agree on a kind of the model of or the kind of structure of constitutional settlement that is more or less agreeable to to them. But with 
in, in 2015 uh, through a process of majoritarian sort of politics, um, a new constitution gets adopted. There is conflict in Tarai, you know, the, and this takes place in the pretext of Nepal, uh, Nepal earthquake, and then kind of you know order block it uh, imposed imposed by India, right? Um, so to conclude, um, as I mentioned, you know, I, I talk, I, I come back now to Polani. Um, if you remember, I, I used. Uh, Polanyi's double transformation uh, as a framework um, at the very beginning. So the argument is that while the transformation in Nepal appears to follow the Polanyian structural logic, that is the kind of movement, the first movement from pre-market, pre-industrial to market society with the kind of nature of uh, you know, commodification of land, labor and money that we've seen uh, throughout the country it does not seem to follow the, the political logic that Polari talks about. That is the second movement. You know, in the double movement, you had the second movement, the movement from below calling for social protection. So the characteristics, you know, this is where I want to kind of qualify and I would invite, you know, questions and comments. And I'm making a distinction here between the kind of, you know, call, calling for social protection versus, you know, what is the nature of social political movements that we've witnessed in Nepal that have emerged since 19. 50s, to me, it appears they are qualitatively very different to that of what Polanyi talks about, uh, you know, in his work in terms of counter movement, right? And and this is particularly because what Polanyi is talking about is he's talking about the kind of you know the market society, right? The kind of destruction caused by market society in the 1990s. What Nepali social movements were fighting for was not so much about the market; it was about the kind of you know the old caste based you know uh, uh, feudal sort of system that had uh, ruled Nepal for a very long time. The nature of social social movements, uh, uh, political movements in Nepal, were qualitatively uh, uh, very different. So social and political mo movements that we have witnessed since 1990s have called for multi multiculturalism, recognition, democratization, <coughs> whose aims have not been to protect society from the whims of market. So market was not the focus there, but to free it from the domination, historical domination uh, emanated from within the society in the form of religion, caste, ethnicity, language, and gender, right? So where do we see the social protection sort of debate now coming in, in Nepal? Um, and I'll come to that after I sort of very briefly sort of talk about, so what Nepal has therefore uh, pursued this particular, you know, Nepal, as, you, as, you, as many of you know, is going through a major demographic sort of transition, which demographers, economists, development economists would talk about demographic dividends, right? So, large number of working age population all over the world, roughly, if other things remain equal, would lead to economic development, rapid economic development, because you have large number of working age population, fewer children, because of, you know, since 1960s, 70s, the, the kind of fertility rate has been going down. So those children, those who were born in 1960s and 70s, they have come up here, right? So what, what you have, what you have is you have a situation where you have a large number of young people, economy has not created jobs. So what the state has relied on is it has basically outsourced uh, Nepal's demographic dividend into highly racialized and class divided economies, kind of global economy, right? And, and this, this particular strategy has consequences for, not just for those migrants, you know, we talk about migrants being ill-treated and all of that, but also for those left behind, not just in terms of remittances, but also in terms of the gaps that are created, right? So labor migration is a very specific phenomenon where someone from that household or people from that household go somewhere else, Right? They are produced in that household, say in a rural village, say in Palpa, where I've done most of my field work. Um, that person gets reproduced, goes to school, gets you know, you know, grows, becomes strong. When that person is ready, so think about like an apple tree or an orange tree, when it's ready and ripe, that person goes and gives all that power, labor power, somewhere else, right? That person does come back. When there is COVID crisis, when that person is old, too old to work, or that when that person is sick or injured, right? So there is a separation between production of the labor in the villages in Nepal, let's say, and the production from that labor. 
and the benefits that the kind of you know dividend is often generated. So what comes out, of course, remittance is very important. It has supported Nepal's uh, uh, economy uh, in general in terms of uh, 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 Nepal's uh, foreign kind of exchange. Um, you know, having U.S. dollar. Uh, to import all the goods that we all enjoy, if there are no remitt remittance, and you know that is sent in U.S. dollar, it, you know the balance of payment uh, crisis would hit, just like Sri Lanka or you know elsewhere. Um, so, final point I would say, and I'll stop, uh, Professor um, Lawathi, uh, is to talk about. So, where is this you know kind of debate on social protection now emerging in Nepal from? It's not you know I don't see it's it's coming out of you know uh, social and political movements. Uh, from civil society groups or from professional groups and you know migrant rights groups, it's largely from, coming from um, uh, international organisations. For instance, you know you go to uh, ILO, other groups, uh, and Nepal has o o over a period of time. And I was just looking at this, uh, you know, this morning as well that Nepal's government spends considerable. You know, if you think about historically. Uh, it did not spend any 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 uh, money uh, because of the very different logic of capitalist development in, in this part of the world. Uh, world its pension uh, started by you know UML government was the first sort of you know apart from the pensions that you know uh, civil servants and others would get was the first form of social protection that was uh, offered. And now uh, world its pension is four thousand. Okay, of course, a lot has happened in terms of. Kind of inflation and so on, and there are, I think, uh, is it 76 schemes uh, currently in operation? I think uh, the government spends about 12 percent of its budget on on what they call social protection. So there are these are some of headline sort of figures. Uh, so I'll leave it up to the audience to see, you know, how what does it actually mean, you know, for this uh, 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 to see this demand for, for social protection emanating uh, not necessarily from uh, below but from uh, uh, international organizations or, and then adopted by, by the government. So I'll conclude here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much Professor Sharma for a very detailed and interesting uh, analysis uh, of the social transformation going on, I guess, especially in the rural areas. Uh, I guess now we open the floor for questions and comments. Before that, let me just briefly make my comments, if I may. Uh, I think it's a great work, great attempt to capture the social transformation in rural areas. But I'm not sure whether I would uh, call it the great transformation. I think there is transformation, no doubt at all. But even uh, looking back at Polanyi's work, where rapid industrialization uh, destroyed, not destroyed, but I mean, people had to work 14 hours and 15 hours. So there was a very, very bad conditions for the people who, there was mice, mass migration to urban areas due to industrialization. Thank you. To in, due to industrialization and so on, and, be, uh, and that then led to the counter movement for the rights of the workers, and that introduced certain hours as working hours and other rights of the thing, and so on. So, uh, in Nepal, I mean, definitely there is transformation. Definitely, I think one can make a good case that it is beyond incremental transformation, much more than incremental transformation, but great transformation. I, I'm not so sure about it. And especially if we look at, uh, make a comparative study. Uh, just, uh, I mean, in India, for example, one can, I think, easily make that the, the much more greater transformation, much more larger transformation in Indian society and politics uh, than in Nepal. Uh, so then what, what do we call uh, the Indian transformation, the Bangladeshi transformation, maybe the African countries transformation, where I think after the end of the um, Second World War, uh, what Professor Sarma described to different extent and maybe to a larger extent have occurred in many, many countries, developing countries and so on. So is the world going through a great transformation? I don't know. Uh, and so on. 
And with regard to Nepal, for example, <coughs> uh, the, f the political transformation, uh, Professor Saran briefly uh, mentioned federalism, uh, secularism. Uh, from my point of view, I think we don't really have a federalism, it's pseudo-federalism, where the provinces don't have power at all. So that, that's pseudo -fair. Secularism is also pseudo-secularism. I mean, the constitution says it's a secular country, but immediately then qualifies it. Uh, so, and in practice, then, okay, that, that's the constitutional provisions. But what about Nepal? I think Nepal is still a practicing Hindu uh, country. Uh, well, whether, I mean, well, whatever the constitution says. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, I totally, I mean, agree that there have been transformations. And I applaud his attempt to capture the transformation that's ongoing, especially in the rural areas. But just my kubal at the <laughs> title. And with the causality also, I, I don't know, the international I mean, organizations and so on, I, mean, I, mean, I will not comment on that much. With that, I'll open the floor uh, to the audience. Please, I mean, if you have your comments, uh, state it briefly. If you have a question, try to be brief. And uh, I think there are volunteers with uh, microphones. If you raise your hand, I'll direct the microphones to your seats. The gentleman at the front. Uh, thank you, Professor Lahwati. I'm Reshan Thapa. It's all right. It's audible. Uh, this is Reshan Thapa from Tribune University. Uh, a commendable work, Professor Sharma. Uh, only two points I have, right? First one is, uh, this is not first time I'm saying, I feel uncomfortable listening from the learned person that uh, earthquake played a major role for the constitution drafting of Nepal. I totally disagree with it. That's not the, you know, stuff we have to make it. It is not the first time I'm commenting on it. Here in England, in wherever. That's a serious issue that uh, 70 years of people's political and whatever effort. And that's a too random thing, right? Half a year thing than uh, earthquake. So that's, that's what pinches me always, uh, that the constitution was drafted because of course earthquake, that's very bad. Next one is regarding those chapters and all whatever you try to portray the, uh, the society and transformation. I agree with uh, Professor Lawati that uh, great transformation, we have to qualify why it is great, right? The transformation, even the transformation is, gives a kind of positive vibe to me. So some negative changes are also there. That's how I would say changes or major changes or shiftment or something like that. If I were you, I would have been going that way. And last one is my comment is, you know, it, it, just the points, uh, the putting the air and air and there, you know, 96, 2006 and like that. And why not do we think uh, major uh, structural or institutional frame, for example, say, Mahendra's 16 years, Virendra's 16 years, Giriza's 15 years, or Prachanda's 15 or 16 years. If we see measure those 15, 15 years, 16 years period, then measure economic, social, and uh, other changes, we can see the pattern in e everyone. And again, with earthquake thing, my reservation is in the police history, only 1990 was the year where the commitment and disbursement was 100% in our. Uh, for an aid or assistance commitment. And during the earthquake, I think a quarter of uh, commitment was realized, even less if we calculate properly. That's how overall uh, subject matter looks very, you know, appealing to me. Then my humble suggestion would be, you know, I read your book, but it is not inside that earthquake thing, but, uh, you know, giving earthquake that much, you know, credit for our constitution, I, I really have a reservation on it. And all other transformation, earthquake, and then after it comes to the, in our social change, uh, what's happening is, uh, is too vague, right? Maybe uh, methodologically we uh, disagree each other, because I'm an economist and you're a sociologist, anthropologist, then methodologically we may disagree, but uh, we have to a little bit focus on it uh, in some points, for example, say, let's say health and education only, then we killed our philanthropical things and only the earthquake brought out is the philanthropical ideas of Nepalese people comes to the surface that was killed in first education policy in Ataishan. That's how picking a couple of examples and particularize with uh, examples which give like sweet, very you know, nice taste to the readers like me. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, over here. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. I'd like to ask you what is the triggering factor of the Great Transformation? Uh, so let me just elaborate my idea. Uh, in like in 1989, there was a 1989 there was an earthquake that was where people felt like okay things are getting worse now we have to get things right because now if people get comfortable with the status quo, I think you get me. So whenever there is change happens like 2001, there was the Royal NASCAR. So now people think that this entire institution's credentials and legitimacy failed. So that are my ideas. So I would like to know what are your ideas that caused the great transformation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I also have a question regarding great transformation once again. Uh, I'm Rachana, I'm from University of Bristol. Uh, I wanted to understand uh, if uh, or where does great transformation lie in a temporal scale and if you need to place it in a temporal scale and uh, if you do, how do you de-alienate de de it from other epochs that are not as great? So what's the rationale there? And, um, and I think the second question is sort of a follow-up on what I'm saying in the first one. Uh, so if we say great transformation is a macro framework, I don't know what else. I, I, I don't have other way to actually talk about it. If you say it's a macro framework, uh, my question is like, how do you, how do we use macro framework in our work so that we are not reductive of, uh, you know, intersectional agencies of marginal, marginalized groups that you are talking about? How do you not, how do we talk in a non-reductive sense? Thank you. We can take two more questions and let him answer. So there is a gent uh, lady, a gent lady over there. Hi, um, I preface my question with a disclaimer. I haven't read your book, so probably you discussed this. But your name, please. My name is Amina, Amina C. I teach. Um, you, when, at the beginning of your talk, you kind of said that your main argument was, you know, kind of citing Pauline's work, that the counter movement didn't happen, uh, especially in terms of social protection. Um, how do you explain that? What, what's your analysis of why it didn't happen? So I, I probably missed it. Thank you. One more question, then, uh, if not, then uh, I'll ask Professor Sarma to respond to the comments and questions. I think uh, I'll go in the other order, if that's okay, to answer answer the questions uh, to the extent I can. I think yes. Um, so, what explains the absence of uh, organized sort of Counter movement to, to to the market. I think that's a very important question, and I don't think I have the full answer. So uh, what I've offered here is a descriptive answer in terms of the absence of uh, counter movement in a Polanyan sense. I think what, what we need to kind of see here is, um, uh, which I've alluded to in, in my talk, is uh, the the nature of social and political movements that we've seen in Nepal. Uh, very much saw, uh, you know, questions of um, uh, Nepal's sort of own history dominated by particular caste and ethnic uh, groups being the kind of core source of, of uh, concern, right? So market forces uh, have not, uh, you know, I would have, for instance, you know, I have looked at uh, the work of, say, trade unions in Nepal, and which is where I would have thought that some of these movements, some of these articulations would would come. And I think to me that remains a sort of paradox as to why is it that there is no organized uh, social movement from below uh, in Nepal, despite the evidence that the, the, the whims of the market forces that have uh, completely, I would argue, uh, commodified uh, land, labor, and, and money uh, uh, throughout uh, throughout Nepal. Um, so that remains uh, an open question in the sense that I'm not really able to kind of. And this is where the puzzle for me is. You know, I, I think I gave this talk uh, last last time at uh, Tripoli University, and um, 
and someone asked me, well, you don't really talk much about the kind of you know, social protection uh, you know, programs and, and, and so on that the government of Nepal has introduced. You know, I went back and, and you know, kind of did more research on that. And these are, to me, they seem very much piecemeal. These are not based on the kind of what I call demand. These are not demand based, right? These are basically largely prescription based that have come out uh, from experts, let's say, uh, who thought that, well, you know, Nepal is, is you know, going through this uh, process of uh, transformation. People's lives are, uh, particularly those who work in the informal sector, but also, you know, elderly, disabled, need some sort of protection, and therefore these uh, uh, provisions have been added. So I really don't know the absence of it, and I don't really fully explain uh, uh, I'm not able to, I, mean, I do describe, but I'm not able to kind of uh, uh, show that why is there, there an absence of uh, the kind of social movement that I think a simple answer what one could say if I want to kind of avoid going to the root is look, Nepal is a very different context, the kind of counter movement that we've seen, uh, we're fighting for certain kinds of, 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 of you know, questions around equality, justice, citizenship, and so on. Uh, but market force, I think, to me, maybe it's, it's the right time to kind of talk about, to me, the puzzle is, Nepal, of course, you know, um, as, as Mahendra, uh, Professor Mahendra Lawati had just said, you know, it's a pseudo-federalism, you know, pseudo-secularism and, and, and so on, but nonetheless, the discursive sort of uh, uh, power of the social movement since 1990s is, 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 is very powerful in terms of the ideas of inclusion, ideas of rights and equality and, and so on. So what I see, for me, the most troubling and the, the, the most critical puzzle is Nepal goes through this sort of, you know, political sort of transformation. Alongside this, where people have a sense of, you know, ideas of rights and citizenship and, and so on at, at varying sort of level. So people are moving away from caste-based and sort of feudal sort of logics, they are being freed, say, from the old sort of logics. Yet, the kind of space that they are finding is the opening of, opening up of labor market, uh, international labor market, highly racialized and, and, and class labor market. So those people, you know, for yesterday's, um, you know, uh, um, bonded laborers, those who worked uh, as Holly for a long time, You'll find them um, in, in different parts of the world, or within, within Nepal as well. It's, it's not that, uh, so for me, what is, what is really puzzling is the kind of simultaneous coexistence of these two uh, 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 forms of political as well as economic movements. I mean, the political movement has taken place within the boundary of the Nepali state, whereas the economic uh, uh, movement is very much global, right? Um, to me, Connecting these two um, would be really, really important to be able to kind of answer that, that question. Coming to the question from, from, from you, I think on a, thinking about macro frame and how do we talk about, you know, without, for me, I was, you know, I'm an anthropologist, so I work with, you know, I travel to uh, places, I spend a lot of time hanging out with people, talking to people. I'm interested in the kind of, as I indicated in my initial questions, uh, I'm not, my interest is not necessarily to explain the kind of, you know, in this presentation, I, I do that in terms of, you know, whether Polanyi's double transformation makes sense, and I've, I've raised a question mark. It, it, you know, part of it does, part of it, it does not. My interest is, is to look at the kind of intimate impact of these transformations on people, right? Uh, uh, from different caste, uh, ethnic, uh, and, and gender sort of uh, backgrounds. So macro, I think to me, this is something quite new for me that, you know, I've been trained as an anthropologist. It's very rare that anthropologists even engage with political economic work. So my first work was, you know, simply titled Crossing the Border to India, which was on effective aspect of you know, the argument being that money is not the reason why people are going to India, it was about masculinity, it's the idea of, you know, cultural migration and so on. That work was very much sort of, you know, not looking at the kind of, you know, larger, you know, I don't really make any, any large arguments around political economy and so on. 
I think, and this is a point I'm making, not just for this presentation, is I think we need to kind of look at the structural sort of factors, um, even when we sort of go deep uh, in our own narrow uh, uh, subject areas to try and locate uh, what kind of forces are saving some of these perceptions, some of these understandings, experiences, and, 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 and so on. So on a temporal basis, uh, of course, you know, in Western Europe it was a very different time. I think the first argument being that you know, we have a very different uh, history of, of, of capitalism in, in this part of the world. Uh, so if great transformation for Polanyi was about getting rid of social protection by, by the whims of the market, right? Uh, in Nepal, there has not been social protection of any kind because the state uh, has only started talking about social protection, right? I'm not saying that we are somehow going to catch up with the West. No, it's a very different rhythm of, of, uh, of um, uh, uh, transformation. In, in, in. So commodification of labor, for instance, is, is not just something that started in the last few decades. Uh, we, have, we have a very good history of, you know, for instance, uh, the caste. If, if you take an example of, say, land or, or, or caste, you know, land, if you think about land, land, uh, it's still associated uh, uh, with, despite being commodified, land was about belonging. Land was about, you know, uh, a, a place it, it did not always have, except in, in some, of course, commodification takes place in the history of Nepal in different uh, uh, time period, right? Um, land was very much, it was about, it was, you know, people did not necessarily put uh, value to every piece of land, right? So right now you have value to, a company in this place cost this month. It's been commodified. It's been exchanged. Uh, similarly, you have a situation of you know when uh, Nepali hillmen started going to British Army. What did they bring? They bring they brought cash, right? So the need of cash, the kind of access to cash, and today not just in cities. You go to villages. You know without cash, it's very very difficult for you to kind of meaning what kind of expenses people have, right from <laughs> Uh, mobile recharge uh, kind of necessity, which has become a necessity, to buying, uh, you know, rice. You know, when I went to school, uh, you know, sugarcane was called uh, cash crop. Rice was not called cash crop. Is that definition any more true? Rice is something to be uh, bought and sold in the market. It has a value. It has a kind of, you can cons instantly convert rice into cash now, right? Increasingly so, of course, to very different action. I'm not trying to kind of generalize that the process is the same everywhere. So, in, in temporal sort of terms, the commodification is is occurs very differently in, in my understanding. So, what causes great, great transformation? I think, um, yeah, I think you talk about you know certain events. Uh, um, I would not sort of limit uh, myself to those events for great transformation. To me, as I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, I'm, 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 I'm trying to kind of mix, kind of understand great transformation, transformation in two different ways, right? So one is in terms of which Professor Lavati agrees to is, yes, it's more than incremental, perhaps some kind of, you know, rapid change, but it's probably not the kind of, you know, great transformation in, in, in Polanyi and so sort of sense. In the sense, what Polari talks about, for me, the great transformation occurs when market makes our lives very difficult, right? So we begin to kind of be the servants of the market. So instead of we needing market for our own freedom, for our own well-being, for our own sort of to, to live uh, to our fullest capacity, market begins to kind of drive uh, our life, every, every aspect of our life, right? And that basically um, is a very impersonal pro process, right? Uh, market is ruthless in, in that sense. Market does not acknowledge our kind of feelings and you know kind of effective sort of aspects of, of our lives. So because uh, because of this process, people's lives then begin to kind of you know get destroyed because market forces uh, do not really talk about caring, right? It talks about sort of, you know it has its own logic. So because market begins to kind of destroy, you know, with large number of unemployment and, you know, people, uh, you know, because market demands that people work, you know, 
Is there a market in, in some of the work uh, settings, for instance, that we have in this country or in the Gulf and elsewhere, where people work not for eight hours? So how did this uh, thing of eight hours, ten hours came about? It is because of this counter movement, right? Because there was a concern about labor standards, for instance, right? So counter movement emerges when market forces make our life very difficult, that we find it very difficult to, to live and, 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 and survive. And I think um, uh, to your question uh, uh, in the front, yeah, I take I take your point that uh, you know earthquake. I think, but at the same time, I would say that you know why is it that you know the, the constitution, the kind of constitutional settlement takes place at that particular point in time? It's not to say that you know earthquake earthquake was the reason for a constitution, but that earthquake appears to have worked to, to try and bring political leaders together to, to, to uh, agree on this constitution. So that remains a sort of, you know, it's, it's rather than a causal link, I think we have to kind of appreciate that it is a correlation in that sense. There is something that has happened. It takes place at that time. That, you know, we had second, first constitutional assembly election, second constitutional assembly election, so much of neg negotiations, so many of these, you know, local peace agreements being signed to agree on X, Y, Z, different things. Um, so that remains, you know, I'm, I'm happy for, for you to kind of refute the, the, any, if there is any relationship between earthquake. But the fact remains that it did take place, you know, um, um, uh, next, to, next to each other. And I think the other point that um, you make uh, is, is, I think it's, it's, it's also uh, uh, very important, um, which I think uh, in terms of framing, you know, why use years and not use I think in terms of regime, um, I personally I would not, uh, uh, you know, name uh, a particular regime necessarily by uh, a particular name you know, of, of a leader, for instance. Which is, you know, I agree with what you what you're saying, but in the sense that that's not my style of, you know, I would I would I would see, uh, uh, you know, for instance, Panchayat, I would not call Mahendra or Biran uh, Prasad kind of. Is in, in, in that sense, um, but I appreciate your, your comment on, on that, and I think other things are largely. I would take yours as well as largely as comments. I think, um, yeah, when we, we can call it, you know, pseudo pseudo federalism, or you know, is it a new Nepal, or is it kind of in old Nepal with a bit of denting and painting? Um, um, but yes, so thank you. I think oh, we can take a couple of questions if people are interested. Yeah, the lady at the back, then again the other lady over here. Yeah, please go. Hi, uh, I'm Safina. I'm, I'm just a student at the moment. Um, my kind of comment is a little bit half formed because I have not read the book yet. Um, I just have to stumble across this lecture and I really enjoyed it. Um, my question is in terms of the lack of social movement and social protection here. Do you think that's kind of related to the fact that because there has been quite a ma mass exodus of our young population abroad, do you believe that that could be a contributing factor for the lack of um, a, a movement, for a lack of cohesive, I don't know, <laughs> Um, kind of just an idea formed or uh, reforming or structuring in that sense because they're all abroad and then plus for the laboring side of part of things a lot of remittances here are the reason for social development and in terms of a lot of people investing in their own village schools or hospitals and stuff like that so there hasn't been much uh, I guess will for them to have sort of an uprising in that sense. Good evening. My name is Teresa. I'm working for a rural development organization here in Nepal. And uh, thank you so much uh, for this highly interesting presentation. When I think about this transformation that took place, um, especially in European countries, 
there's one component that was back then not existent, which is omnipresent nowadays, which I want to say is like a technology. One part of it being social media, which is um, giving the opportunity to people who are actually living very far um, from each other, yet to form one voice or to exchange thoughts. And the other one, the other aspect um, beyond social media, being technology in the sense of um, giving, um, for example, political rights, even when you're when you're working abroad. Um, for example, I'm living here, yet I'm able um, to give my vote in uh, national elections in my country by simply attending um, my embassy here and giving my vote. Which doesn't happen <laughs> to all these um, laborers, Nepali laborers who are working abroad, which might be an issue of technology, which might be an issue of political willingness. So I'm wondering, what is your opinion or your research on the factor or the component of technology which um, in this transformation especially interesting because it should boost this counter um, how would you call it, the, the, the counter movement so it's even more interesting when you state it's not there, this kind of counter movement Thank you, I think that is all Okay, one more. Just a question. Yes. No comment. Just a question. You know, what is why we need to counter counter uh, what do you call it? Counter movement. If not, to me is like you know this political transformation or I would say the communist transformation. Some major issues to Nepalese uh, common citizen is still unorganized, right? Politics, even the political parties, the governance level or individual level, so everything is dismantled and we are still to organize. For example, say, if I'm not happy with my legal, whatever entitlement, the government or our political setup gives uh, the legal issues to our Upamaha, what you call it, Upamayar or whatever, but my Upamaha's decision regarding the legal thing is not recognized by the established legal system because the traditional legal system still exists there. Similarly, CDO Carolina should not be there. But if something happens in this hall, we are entitled to go to CDO instead of going to what are parallel. Because of that, this new political setup, knowingly, unknowingly, agreeing with Lawati, see, what we did is we leave all Nepalese citizens unorganized formally and informally. It dismantled one, it will take a few time. That's how the formal or informal, whatever, wherever, wherever, need to be organized and it will come. The signal is in our uh, Sahakari Viruta Andolan and Microfinance Andolan. That's how I think either, don't you think it is the time issues that, uh, you know, counter thing will come? Thank you. Uh, because of this counter movement, I just have a question. What would uh, Professor Sarma think the mouse movement does? Was it a counter movement or not? Yeah. Okay, uh, all really interesting questions. Um, I'll, I'll, I think, you know, you, you make a really important point about, you know, young people being out. And for me, there are two aspects to you know any social movements, right? So you, you need a mass base, and you need uh, kind of you know um, middle classes, um, who intellectuals who articulate. I think we are not short of intellectuals uh, in in this country. I think you know we have uh, people who have successfully sort of challenged and you know late social movements and, and so on. I think one thing that is definitely different uh, to that of you know what Polanyi talks about in, in, in that particular context is. The nature of labor, right, uh, which you alluded to in terms of overseas, but even if it is not overseas, the kind of informal labor, that is not factory based labor, so you can't really organize, and that explains the sort of state of trade union um, uh, mobilizations, right? And the other thing is it's extremely difficult to mobilize on the basis of class and precarity, as it would be relatively easier to kind of uh, say organize people on the basis of caste or ethnicity or gender. Um, class is, 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 is not, a, a class consciousness is, is, is not an easy uh, organizing sort of sort of factor. But, you know, I take your point that, you know, well, you know, is it because for me, 
it's it's not that necessarily. Of course, intellectuals and you know, um, uh, civil society leaders and others do take you know, do read what what is there in, in, in society, and then sort of articulate. They are the ones who articulate. Uh, I think in, in Nepal, we've not we've not really seen that. It could be because those issues. You know, is it a failure of the intellectual class, or is it a failure of kind of the nature of the kind of, not the failure, but the, is it because of the nature of the economy um, that we, we kind of time we live in, in the neoliberal sort of world. Then we, it's not, you know, I, I use the word neoliberal, but it, it's, you know, so what we see in Nepal, I would not want to necessarily categorize it as, as neoliberal, you know, it's, uh, if in the West, it's precarity is, is the kind of, you know, it's a result of neoliberalism, we've lived with precarity for ages, you know, people are not, becoming precarious today because of whatever kind of, you know, structural adjustment programs and, and neoliberal economy. Nepali people have always lived precarious lives. So that concept of precarity, as it would apply in the West, would not, in my argument, apply uh, in, in our context. I think the question on technology is very interesting. And, you know, I kept thinking, and I don't think I have an answer to that, but I think you, you kind of allude to possibilities of technology being used. But I'll go back to Polanyi for that, you know, just like market society, you know, we're living in a technology society. So is the technology serving society or is the society serving technology is the fundamental question, I think. I think that is what would explain why that technology is probably not being the medium. When we think of technology, when we think of technology in positive sense, we're thinking about technology as a medium, right? Are we the kind of, uh, are we the consumers of technology or are we the products of technology? We think we are consumers, but actually we are the products, right? Because our data is, is what is driving this whole thing. In, as far as I mean, I'm not a technology expert, uh, but nonetheless, that's my understanding. Um, yes, it could be. It could be time. It could be time. Um, you know, I, t I take your point. Uh, it's not that you know there are no labor unions. You know, there have been you know labor movements in Nepal in the past as well. Um, is it about, I think, what the example you gave is, is really important. It's something I, I meant to kind of explain. You know, one good example uh, is uh, something that you just mentioned on movement from below is this, uh, on this interest, right? It, it, what do you call this uh, meter bads? Uh, uh, so people have actually come out uh, in the streets um, um, uh, because this is a market force. That market force was ruthless. It, it operated at, at its own logic. It destroyed people's lives. People, you know, ended up being depressed. Being, you know, some people committed suicides, as, as we know, has basically dismantled. And because there is so much desperation, people did come out uh, or have come out together. And would it, you know, would it be time, for instance, uh, that you know, would ultimately, or does it need to affect other people from other walks of life? Uh, by the market, that, that people will somehow come together. Yes, I think it's a, it's a question I get asked all the time. You know, what was Maoist uh, movement? I think you could argue that when the, you know, if you look at the 40-point demand and the initial sort of articulation of the Maoist movement, I think they were. You know, if you look at the demands and some of the, some of the initial sort of, you could argue that there was a kind of you know kind of counter movement. But you know, I've looked at you know uh, Nepal's uh, comprehensive peace agreement and it's follow up, right? So in terms of state restructuring, despite pseudo, you know, federalism and pseudo secularism, we've, we've achieved that in, in the constitutional settlement. Do people know what happened to all those questions around land, livelihoods, both that featured in 40 point demand, and that also featured in UN mediated, comprehensive kind of peace process with resulting in comprehensive peace accord? Where are we on those? Right? So, so I would sort of have this sort of half big sort of answer as to, you know, I think the initial promise was very much based on that. Uh, and some of that did feature in the comprehensive peace accord. Yeah, you know, you talk about the kind of constitutional settlement, the kind of post conflict in terms of, you know, disappearance commission and truth and reconciliation commission. We've made some headway on, on those, at least in paper we've made headway in terms of the declaration of the violent secular and, you know, all, all that. But you know, I did follow up in writing this book and, and for later, the questions uh, of, of livelihoods, land, um, uh, uh, there's nothing.
there is no, no not even a single institutional development. Forget about the kind of real uh, kind of uh, things that we can see. Um, you know, we, we've talked about Nepal. Kind of, you know, I, I have talked about, for instance, state restructuring and you know politically new, new Nepal. But in terms of the kind of economic restructuring, which is also very much there in in Maoist agenda, and and it also a little bit in in the conflict and peace agreement. I don't think we see that anywhere. And I think market is not seen, therefore, as an enemy or uh, as something, a destructive force uh, yet, but it could be time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sarma, for a very detailed, systematic, and well-researched presentation. Uh, and I would like to thank the audience for very interesting questions, as well as Social Science Baha for regularly organizing these very insightful and interesting uh, lecture series. So it's been 109, so I guess it's been going on for a long time, and I wish it will go on for a, a very long time as well. So with that, I think I'm supposed to give this momento to Professor Sarma from Social Science Baha. Everyone, please. Give us so, with that, I think we are over. And just, I mean, Deepak hinted me the next lecture is on August 17th, and I'll be the one who will be delivering it. Thank you. <laughs> and it's on two party to multi party system consolidation. <laughs>